All right, guys. So let's go into the second part of the class. Not the second part, but the dislocation theories. So for this class, let's write this one. I want to first define the elastic problem, linear elasticity. And define the dislocations burgers vector, the tangent vector, the dislocation line. And most importantly, these locations, they have a stress field. So we will divide this location into two. One is edge, one is screw, and we will define the stress field of these locations. like the stress tensor of this location signal is right. And also the energy of these locations, energy of these locations, which is the total of elastic energy plus the or energy of these locations, then we will talk about the motion of this location. So it can either slip or climb, which is at high temperature, right? or cross slip. So let me start with the elasticity. The elastic problem. Firstly, we have to define the reference configuration. So we will work under very small deformation. Let me write small deformation. And we will use linear elasticity. I assume you guys know what is isotropic elasticity, right? Is there anyone who doesn't know what is isotropic elasticity? Ismail, are you familiar with isotropic or kinematic? John, can you explain it? Yeah, John. All right, guys. So let's say. We are given a system to yield. Then we have some plastic deformation and we go back. Let's say this point is A, B, C. Then we draw the yield surface. The yield surface occurs at the point B. All right, so this is sigma two, this is sigma one. 
from A to B, you start loading your material. Then you're at point B. According to isotropic elasticity, once you go from B to C, your yield surface will expand and it will become like this is the point C. So this is isotropic hardening. According to kinematic hardening, once you go from B to C, you're shifting up your yield surface. So you're again here, but your diameter will remain same. And this is your near A prime. So your tensile strength under tension is different than your tensile strength under compression. And this shift is called as back stress. So here we are assuming the expansion of yield surface. Of course, once you go back from B to C, you will follow this line. This is your new A prime. Then you go back to your to your yield under compression. So this is the yield under compression. All right, let me erase this part. And continue with our notation. Always, you need to set your reference, X, Y, Z. And you have an undeformed, uh, so let's say this is undeformed position. The current configuration. This is default. We have a normal vector ds and dx, which is this domain is x and this is capital X. Let's say again, of course. Ds and Dx. To write displacement, so x is, this is let's say this is center. So our vector and this is our vector to small x domain. Xi is the unit vector of i plus the capital Xi. This is just displacement. In 
in order to find the strain, strain is nothing but the elongation divided by the initial length. We have a strain tensor, of course, Lij, Eij, which is one and a half Ui to the J plus Uj with respect to I. You guys know this notation, right? This is strain. And the, we have compatibility equation, which is EXX or YZ is equal to XY XZ plus XZ XY minus we are doing the compatibility. So we remove the Poisson's ratio term. So this is the compatibility. Equation and most importantly, we come up with an Hooke's law. Sigma ij stress is nothing but the elastic tensor CIJKL times EKL. So this is Hooke's law. And any equation that relates stress and strain is called as constitutive relation. Linear elasticity and Hooke's law satisfies the elastic equilibrium. Again, we have a reference frame Z, Y, and X, let's say. So if you are going from X to Y, your thumb shows the Z direction. This is how you can select your reference frame. You have your volume and your B vector and your N vector. This is running at, we have a stress tensor here. Elastic equilibrium always states that sigma ij with respect to i plus bj is equal to zero and sigma ij for linear isotropic elastic, don't forget, is equal to sigma j i. So here, the Hooke's law, we have an elasticity tensor. It has some basic properties. Let me share the basic properties of this elast elastic tensor because you see we have four different letters. Please don't confuse yourself because we have lots of symmetries. C, I, J, K, L is equal to C, J, I, K, L and it's equal to C, I, J, L, K. And C, I, J, K, L is equal to C, K, L, I, J. So this is due to minor symmetries. And it reduces till since it is six by six tensor, right? We have 36 independent 
constants. After major symmetries, if you apply this major symmetries with minor symmetries, we go down to six by six and we apply the major symmetries. Then we go down to two and one independent constants. And of course, we have a cubic symmetry, cubic symmetry. After cubic symmetry, we only have three, which makes our, the things very easy. Three independent constant. It makes the life very easier. So we will have only C11, C12, C12. Of course, we will satisfy the symmetry, C12, C11, C11, C12, C12, C12. And we have zeros for other terms. The diagonal part is C44, C44, C44. Then these terms are all zeros. And this elastic tensor satisfies the symmetry. So all the zeros will be also at the bottom part of the tensor. So we have only three independent constants, which are C12, C11, and C44. Luckily, since we are working with linear isotropic material for cubic systems. So isotropic elasticity for cubic systems. We have only two independent constants. Let me write C I J K L is equal to lambda chronicle delta I J chronicle delta K L. I'm sure you guys are familiar with these notations. Shear modulus chronicle delta. I K J L plus chronicle delta I L chronicle delta J K and sigma I J you can derive it from via Hooke's law. It is just lambda delta times the strain K K plus two times shear modulus. E I J. All right, guys. So basically, these are just formulas. Let me just sum them up. Let's write the displacement. From displacements, we have displacement is U. We have just three unknowns UX, UY and use that tensor, three unknowns. Strain, what is strain? It's just elongation divided by initial weight, right? The strain definition is one over two. U plus C 
So if we open them up, epsilon ij is nothing, but I'm writing it implicitly. Ui with respect to j, uj with respect to i. So here we have six unknowns, three unknowns. So explicit, let me write it explicitly. Epsilon xx is nothing but del ux with respect to x. Epsilon yy strain along y direction is displacement along y direction over y and strain along x is del uz divided by del z. We have, we know the diagonal parts from these equations, xx, xy, and xz, and xy is nothing but one over two del ux with respect to y plus del uy with respect to x. Then you can calculate your yz and zx. So you can construct your stress tensor, strain tensor with elastic constants. So I assume you guys are familiar with this elastic constants, but let me just remind it for you. This is lame constant. This is shear modulus. So using these two, we can calculate pretty much everything or other two elastic properties can be calculated through. We always learn this Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio approach, but they are they are related with each other. For example, E is just shear modulus, three lame constant plus two shear modulus divided by their summation. And Poisson's ratio is nothing but lame constant two plus lame constant plus shear modulus. So I don't wanna go into the deeper formulas and I'll just stop the formulas at this specific point and I'll just share the PowerPoint presentation. I'll just go through of this PowerPoint presentation very, very quickly. So we start with elastic theory. So let me just open the PowerPoint. Okay, so the milestones in the history of this location. The first attempt is theory of elasticity. It starts with Volterra and very basic equations from Timpe. Then the very, very important milestone is postulating of edge dislocations by basically Orovan and Taylor. We have lots of Orovan equations and Taylor formulations. So we divide dislocations into two. First one is edge dislocation. 
And the second one is screw dislocations by Burgers. Frank Reed calculate the mechanisms of dislocation and the source of dislocations. And we call the source of dislocations as Frank Reed source. And of course, these are all theoretical. And the first attempt to observe the dislocation was carried out in 1956 via transition electron microscopy. So this is the basic milestones in the history of dislocations. So dislocations are basically the lattice defects, like the imperfections. But these are all dislocations, the black lines, and they are the carrier of plastic deformations. Without any dislocation, without any imperfection, we don't have a plastic deformation. And this is the Frank Reed source. It basically creates dislocation. Actually, this should be a GIF, but I'm not sure how can I play it. It should be a GIF, but let me just quickly show what's going on. This is first dislocation. Then we will have, oops, I can't draw. Anyway, let me try it via Zoom. So it will create the further dislocations. So we have a Frank Reed source. It will create several other dislocations and they will evolve. And they pin at these points these points. This is the source of this location and we call it as Frank Reed source. Oops. Oh, let me just delete this drawing, sorry guys. Annotate and clear all drawings. Okay, guys, do you have any question uh, so far? Please ask your questions. Do not hesitate to ask any question. So this no. is another, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Like I was gonna say, it was clear. Sorry. Okay, so. We have edge and screw dislocations, and there was an observation of a screw dislocation in iron, and this is via TEM. Using TEM, you can observe the motion of this location and you can also calculate the density of these locations and velocity of these locations. So we need two things for the postulation of this location. First thing is we need a theory of linear defects. So we need, we, we have to know the theory of defects and we have some experimental observations, but they couldn't explain via like the classical theory. So that trigger scientists to postulate dislocation theory. So I'll I'll just um, 
share this PowerPoint with you and I'll not go ahead and read every detail with you. But next week, uh, you'll come to class and we will discuss all of these Volterra elements, Volterra element cuts, like the Volterra considered the elastic properties of a cut in a continuum corresponding to slip or these locations. And please, you guys have an idea, then we will discuss these terms with you. The necessity of this location is obvious, right? Without this location, we don't have any plastic deformation. And we apply shear stress to a material or a normal stress to a material which creates a shear stress in the microstructure. And that shear stress creates the movement of this location. So here, Frankel estimated the theoretical shear strength using a, just a periodic force law. So it goes to Hooke's law, and it is basically the theoretical shear stress is shear modulus times the Berger's vector divided by 2 pi times A, which is lattice constant, divided by uh, multiply 2 pi X divided by B. So it goes like G times X in the location divided by A. And the maximum value, of course, X become B over 2 pi. Then the maximum theoretical stress is GB divided by 2 pi A. Perfect. So at the theoretical shear stress, which is critical resource shear stress, we have first dislocation moment. The first dislocation occurs at this specific theoretical shear stress, which is also considered as critical resource shear stress. So once you apply shear stress, you break the bonds. Basically, this plane goes to this plane, then you will see such a compression. Then you will see some motion at this region. I'm not sure why I cannot play these GIF files. Let me just check, is there any way to play it? But in YouTube, you can check it or I'll try to do it later on. And suppose you have such a crystal. How can you identify the dislocation and the Burgers vector? Do you guys have any idea? Suppose these are all atoms and we know the center of atoms. We know the, for example, here we have vacancy, like a void here. But how can we find the location of this location? Any idea? Basically, what we do is we take a line and we just match, we just draw a split line from the center of an atoms you will see the straight lines. But once you come here, the straight line comes till this atom, but here the location is different. Here we have some disturption and the line continues like this. Again, once you draw all the straight lines from the center of an atoms, you will see some disturption at certain points. That means we have a dislocation here. 
And how we define the Burger spectra? All right, so you have a crystal. You start with any point. This is slip direction. So slip is just the region. Okay, let me not mention that. So we start with this circuit, for example. This is the tangent line. This is the slip line. We go two blocks up, one, two. We go four blocks left, two blocks down, and three blocks right to close this circuit. That means there is something wrong because we went four blocks left, but three blocks right. In order to make it perfect crystal, we need one more block to go from left to right, which is the burger's vector direction. This is for edge dislocation. And burger's vector is just perpendicular to dislocation direction. So this is the dislocation tangent line, and this is the Burgers vector. Dislocation tangent line is perpendicular to Burgers vector. We have basically two vectors. One is tangent dislocation motion. So dislocate dislocation uh, tangent line is this direction, and Burgers vector of an edge dislocation is perpendicular with the tangent line of dislocation. How about an edge dis uh, screw dislocation? Okay, we start at this point. We went two up, two left, one inside, two left, that means four left. We went two up and go down to bottom. We go from left to right, four blocks, then we have an unclosed circuit, which is, which should go to outwards, just opposite direction of this inward notation, which is basically the Burgers vector. If you add your Burgers vector to the system, you're eliminating the distortion and you are creating a perfect crystal. So this is screw dislocation. Any questions so far? John, from where can we determine the tangent line? Sorry, ask it again. Yes. So we have ten, ten, tangent line in here. How we can determine it? This is the location of a dislocation. So we have an extra half plane of atom at this location, right? Which is the location of dislocation. So our dislocation is here, which creates distortion. And this is just the tangent line of that dislocation. Here, basically, we have dislocation. Here, we have an edge dislocation. So this is the extra half plane. This plane is the extra half plane. That is why we have the edge dislocation. And this is the tangent line of the dislocation. Okay. Perfect. So the Burgers vector represents the magnitude and direction of the lattice distortion. So the Burgers vector, let's check, check again. It represents, this Burgers vector represents the magnitude, since it's a vector, we have a magnitude and it has a direction. Also, it represents the direction of 
of lattice distortion. How much we distort the lattice and what is the direction of uh, distortion? Basically, this tangent vector also represented as line vector. We can both call line vector and the uh, Burgess vector. So for edge dislocation, the line vector or the, so this is the line of edge dislocation again. We have extra half plane here. And the line is this line. For edge dislocation, tangent vector is perpendicular to the Burgers vector, which represents the magnitude and the direction of distortion of the lattice. And for screw dislocation, tangent vector is parallel to Burgers vector. Perfect. And this distortion is just due to it's due to dislocation, either edge dislocation or the or the screw dislocation. And uh, don't forget the direction of the vector depends on the plane of these locations. And the dislocations, they are they occur one of the closest packed crystallographic planes. For example, for FCC, the dislocation occur at one, one, one plane. All right, so let's go back to other examples. Burgers uh, circuits. We have to close the circuits. So let's check. Let's check the example. We start at this atom and I'm going from here to here. So I passed one atom. So this is one atom. This is another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this way I pass ten atoms from bottom to top. One, uh, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, six up. And I have to go back an atom from here. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So let's count it again. I think I did some mistake. So this is one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, it should be. 10 and this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this is the 11th block. I think we can also go from here to close the perfect crystal. So to make a perfect burger's loop, we have to go 10 right and 10 left and close it from here. Then I have to go six blocks down. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, this is the perfect block. And the remaining part, this part is the Burgers vector direction. This is the Burgers vector. So I'll I'll send several examples to you, which you can work on. Can you show again the Burgers vector? 
<laughs> so once you cl uh, close your burger circuit, once you do again, you can. You don't need to go tap. You can do, for example, you start here. Okay, maybe you can do one, two, three, four, five, six. As you see, we will have some distortion here. Seven. Let's do it from seven. Okay. From here to here. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then I go down by six. One, two, three, four, five. Six. So this is the distortion. And Berger's vector is this guy right here. And this Berger's vector represents the magnitude. It is only one magnitude. And the direction, which is this direction of the this location. All right, I'll, I'll share some burger circuit example with you, then you guys can work on it. Just clear all my drawings. Let me check time. Okay, so the definition of this location, the best definition for me is this location is the part in between slipped region of the crystal and the unslipped part of the crystal. So till here, you slipped your material. You have a block here. You slipped your block and you, you come till this point. Then this part has not slipped yet. And this location, is the imperfection that locates in between slipped region of the crystal and the unslipped region. Once you push your load, once you apply further load, you will see a, another block at this location. Let me just annotate. We are calling it unslipped because it hasn't slipped yet. Once you see the remaining block, which is this block right here, then that part is also slipped. You just send this part you have like one, two, three, four, five. You, you compress till here, compress the material till here, and you have the same block. This element, but it hasn't, that element hasn't gone to this region. So we don't have any slip at this region. Once we see the element, the whole block moves from initial point to end point. So of course, these atoms push these atoms, these atoms. So this part, this group of atom will slip till here. I'm just representing like this, but this is not correct, of course. It goes like pairwise interactions with pair, pairwise interactions and one by one. And the, this location represents the boundary between slipped and unslipped regions of crystal. 
Due to this, these locations must be a closed group or and at the free surface of the crystal or and at the grain boundary. So at the end of the crystal, once you slipped all the crystal, you will not have unslipped region. Therefore, we don't see any dislocation if you slip your crystal until this point. So if you come till this point, we don't have any dislocation. Dislocation all slipped. So the motion of dislocation is by slip. And this is the dislocation line. Or if we have a grain boundary, all right, this is the region that separates the slip and uns. If this is the region that separates the slip and unslip region, this location should end at the grain boundary because this is the end point or the free surface like this boundaries. All right. So let me stop at this point and give 10 minutes break. After 10 minutes, we will continue. <laughs> 